This is the second video of the four-part series on sailboat racing. The focus for this video will be sails and sail shape. Sails come in a variety of shapes and sizes, but the principles are the same. In the last video, we learned how sails change the momentum of the wind, thereby creating forces that drive a boat forwards, as well as pushing it sideways. We looked at how a keel is a hydrofoil that has an associated lift and drag force vector. Sails are airfoils, just like wings. They are asymmetrical, they are thin, and they are soft. They can generate lift, and they have drag that is composed of two components. The first part is friction drag, also called parasitic drag. The other is induced drag, which is a byproduct of creating lift. Let's look at a cross-section of a sail that is positioned in a stream of continuously flowing air. If the sail is located in a wind tunnel, we can vary the angle of attack and measure the lift and drag forces. Here is a typical plot. As the angle of attack is increased, the lift also increases up until the point that the sail stalls, and then lift decreases. Drag increases as the angle of attack is increased. A flat plate can also act as an airfoil, although not a very good one. Many different airfoil shapes have been developed over the years. Here is a partial collection of airfoils that were categorized and tested by the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics in the 1930s. NACA published lift and drag curves for each of these shapes as a function of angle of attack. The designer of an airfoil would like to maximize lift and minimize drag in any given set of conditions. If we plot the ratio of lift to drag, as shown here in green, we can see that there is an optimum angle of attack which will give the best performance. As discussed before, sails are airfoils. You can adjust the angle of attack with the sheet and the boat's heading. Resist the temptation to over-trim. Ideally, you want a constant angle of attack from the top to the bottom of the sail. But the apparent wind angle is different at different heights above the water. The wind is stronger at higher elevations. Let's understand the concept of apparent wind in more detail. The true wind is shown in this diagram by the red vector. But the forward motion of the boat also creates a wind component, and it is shown here by the purple vector. The apparent wind, which is what is experienced by the sails, is the sum of the two vectors, and it is shown here in green. Since the true wind speed is stronger at higher elevations, the apparent wind angle at the top of the mast is further on the beam than it is at deck level. In order to make sure that all parts of the sail are operating at the same angle of attack, the sail needs a small amount of twist, as shown in this photograph of a 470 dinghy. Sails are not flat surfaces. They have curvature. The term draft refers to how deep the curvature is. Different conditions call for different amounts of draft. Use more draft for acceleration power, especially in lighter winds, and use less draft for reducing healing and pointing higher in heavier winds. You'll note that the sails in this photograph look relatively flat because the conditions are somewhat breezy. Sails are made from sheets of flat material. The sailmaker can cut and sew the panels of sailcloth in such a manner that the draft can be built in. The crew can change the amount and position of the draft by adjusting a number of controls, such as halyard tension, Cunningham, outhaul, mast bend, boom van, battens, forestay sag, jib track position, and sheet tension. The mainsail and jib need to work together to be effective. There is a slot between the two sails, and this should not be obstructed. It is normal to sheet the main end about 10 degrees tighter than the jib. Looking at the boat in this photo, 
you'll see that the slot is not obstructed at all. In this photo, a staysail is used with a spinnaker to create two slots. The crew has several tools available to aid in trimming the sails correctly. Telltales on the forward portion of the jib can be used to help steer the boat to the correct angle of attack and to position the jib sheet cars. Speed stripes, sometimes called draft stripes, can be used to estimate draft and twist. If the forward section of the main has a bubble or backwinds, the slot needs to be opened up slightly. If a sail's leech is fluttering, an adjustment of the leech cord may be called for. The masthead fly is an important tool when sailing off the wind. If the center of effort produced by the sails is too far forward, the boat will tend to fall off to leeward if the wheel or tiller is released. In this case, the boat is said to have lee helm, and the helmsman must compensate accordingly. If the center of the sail's effort is too far aft, the boat will tend to round up toward the wind. This is called weather helm, and a small amount is desirable. Lee helm must be avoided. Changing the mast rake, either forward or back, can be used to adjust lee or weather helm. Some helmsmen are prone to pinching because you're pointing higher than the competition. Unfortunately, the speed drops off if you pinch. If you come off the wind a bit, you are footing. Speed is great, but you're not making much progress to windward. The ideal situation is to choose a heading that maximizes your velocity in the direction of the next mark. Polar diagrams are a powerful tool that has been developed to help crews sail the optimum course. Here is a polar diagram for a hypothetical 36-foot displacement-style keelboat. The four different colored curves represent true winds of 6, 10, 15, and 20 knots. The concentric circles represent boat speed in knots, and the angles represent true wind angles. With a true wind speed of 15 knots, the optimum angle to steer upwind is about 40 degrees to the true wind, which will result in a boat speed of about 5.9 knots, and a velocity made good into the wind of about 4.9 knots. Here is an actual polar diagram of a Sovereil 33 sailboat. It is interesting to note the red tick marks, which show the optimum angle to sail downwind in order to maximize the boat speed in the direction of the wind. This clearly indicates that the slowest course to the downwind mark is to sail directly downwind. Jibing downwind is essential, especially at lower wind speeds. Most non-sailors can't believe that it's possible to sail faster than the wind, but it's actually quite simple to understand. Ice boats have been doing it for years, regularly reaching speeds of 50 knots or more. The competitive International Moth class adopted the use of hydrofoils in about the year 2000, and the design literally took off. Hydrofoils are commonly used for sailing speed attempts, and starting in 2013, all competitive America's Cup boats have used foils. It is now even possible to sail a kiteboard on a foil. The use of foils allows the boat to rise completely above the water's surface, thereby eliminating the imaginary barrier of hull speed. Then it is a simple matter of sailing on a heading that will produce a high apparent wind speed, even if the true wind speed is quite modest. This is a polar diagram for a foiling moth. You will note that the boat will be no faster than the wind when sailing dead downwind, but that high speeds are easily attainable when sailing at angles to the wind because the boat speed vector adds to the true wind vector to produce a high apparent wind speed vector. It is now time to review some of the concepts that have been presented and put them in context with the overall objective, which is winning sailboat races. From our discussions about polar diagrams, you'll recognize that for a given set of wind conditions, there is an optimum angle that should be steered both upwind and downwind to maximize your velocity component in the direction toward the next mark. When sailing downwind in lighter airs, 
it sometimes makes sense to alter course by 5 or 10 degrees in a direction that will move the apparent wind vector forwards. Tighten the sheet slightly to match the new apparent wind angle and watch as the boat speed starts to increase. This boat speed increase then moves the apparent wind vector even further forward, allowing you to slowly change course further downwind. Next thing you know, you're almost back on the original course, but you're going faster. This useful procedure is commonly called freshening. Immediately after tacking, boat speed has dropped, especially in lumpy seas. This is the time to ease the sheet slightly, head a bit lower, and allow the boat to accelerate. Then you can slowly come back on course while trimming the sails in. This is analogous to changing gears in a car as you accelerate away from a tight corner. In light air, you want fuller sails, especially if the water is not smooth. Resist the temptation to pinch and minimize crew movement about the boat. Don't tack any more often than necessary because it can take a long time to get back up to speed after the maneuver. In heavy air, the sail should be flatter. The draft should be kept forward by the use of higher tension and Cunningham. Make sure that the sails have sufficient twist, especially in higher wind speeds. Mast bend can be used to help flatten the mainsail. Leave the boom vang set up hard and depower the main uh, using the main sheet or the traveler as required when puffs hit. You always want some heel when going upwind. In light air, the crew may need to move to leeward. Going downwind, keep the weight forward in light air and aft in heavy air. Don't oversteer. Remember that every time you turn the rudder, it's acting like a brake. Okay, that's the end of video two in this four-part series on sailboat racing. The next video will cover the topic of wind shifts and tactics.